topic is tricky for a number of reasons. First, it's not easy to define consciousness, which makes it difficult to measure. Second, if we do take the plunge and define a concept as abstract as consciousness, we place boundaries around what is included and excluded. The public looks to science to settle issues about consciousness in order to address ethical questions such as determining the end of life. Critical evaluation of the evidence used to make these important distinctions requires information about the strengths and limitations of the methods used by psychologists and neuroscientists to study consciousness. For this tricky topic, I'd like you to take a moment to consider the broader implications of measuring consciousness. Let's consider some famous cases. In 1995, Jean-Dominique Bobby was almost completely paralyzed after a stroke. However, he had complete awareness of his surroundings and is shown here communicating by blinking his left eye. It was by this tedious method that he was able to write a book about his experiences, The Diving Bell and the Butterfly. Bobby died days after the publication of his book in 1997. Another famous medical case of abnormal consciousness was highlighted by the life and death of American Terry Schiavo. Schiavo lived the last 15 years of her life in a persistent vegetative state, and her subsequent death in 2005 by removal of her feeding tube divided not just her family, but also the opinions of a nation. Former Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon was in a permanent vegetative state for eight years following a stroke and died following health complications from kidney failure in January of 2014. Although he was most certainly alive, his non-responsiveness led the Israeli cabinet to declare him permanently incapacitated and unable to rule. Defining consciousness is not just a scientific question, but also a legal and moral one, since it's considered to be a key component to a full life. A perfect definition of consciousness does not exist, but for the purposes of this lesson, we will use a working definition. Most theorists would agree that consciousness involves awareness of one's surroundings, as well as the contents of one's mind. This type of awareness is fundamental for a lot of what our brains allow us to do, such as feel, see, hear, and remember, but is also the cornerstone of the uniquely private experience of just being who we are. How do psychologists and neuroscientists objectively measure such a subjective state? Typically, it involves assessing how awake and aware an individual is. Psychologists and neuroscientists focus on two dimensions of consciousness in attempting to identify conscious states. Wakefulness is represented along the bottom of this figure and refers to the degree of alertness. This distinguishes waking from sleeping. Awareness is along the left of this figure and refers to the degree to which we monitor our outer and inner environments. According to this view of consciousness, each dimension ranges from low to high and all states of consciousness exist somewhere within this two-dimensional space. So for instance, coma is represented in the bottom left of this figure and is characterized by low wakefulness and low awareness, whereas conscious wakefulness in the top right is characterized by high wakefulness and high awareness. Lucid dreaming happens when someone is having a dream and are fully aware. So this unusual state is characterized by low wakefulness, since the dreamer is sleeping, but high awareness. Although this model is not perfect, as we'll see shortly with full consciousness, it does help to point out some important components of consciousness. Let's take a look at the low end of both dimensions of this two-dimensional view. Coma patients have very low awareness and wakefulness but there are a range of mental states that could be considered comatose. In a vegetative state, one form of minimal consciousness, an individual is clearly awake, but does not appear to have much awareness, which seems to have been the case with Terry Schiavo. On the other hand are individuals with locked-in syndrome, like Jean-Dominique Bobby, who, though fully conscious, had very little control over his own voluntary movements. These cases of paralysis with intact cognition pose a significant challenge in medicine because it is difficult to determine the level of consciousness. The Glasgow Coma Scale was developed by two neurology professors at the University of Glasgow's Institute of Neurological Sciences. It's the most widely used tool to measure consciousness in medicine. It uses three particular behaviors, eye-opening, verbal response, and motor responses. The patient's reaction for each of these is recorded and the values are added up. A patient is classified as mild with a score of 13 or more, moderate with a score between 8 and 12, and severe with a score of 8 or less. 
Someone with a score of 3 would basically have no observable activity at all. In a vegetative state, an individual is clearly awake but does not appear to have much awareness, which happened with Terry Schiavo. The reliance on motor responses with the Glasgow Coma Scale is a limitation, especially for those with locked-in syndrome. Luckily, there has been success in using neuroimaging techniques to overcome this. There are a number of neuroimaging techniques used to assess consciousness. In 2006, researchers at the University of Cambridge found evidence of consciousness in a patient in a vegetative state. Using functional MRI, researchers found that her auditory areas in her temporal lobes were active when listening to speech. Furthermore, when asked to imagine certain actions, such as playing tennis or walking around her home, she showed the same brain activation as a control patient without head injury. The fact that she could respond with her own brain activity in an intentional, purposeful way allowed her to communicate despite her inability to make motor responses. Other neuroimaging techniques are based on EEG, which is measured from electrodes placed on the scalp. It produces an output that looks like a bunch of random squiggles. It might seem difficult to make sense out of EEG data since there's a lot going on. However, if someone carries out a task many times and the EEG traces are added together, it's possible to see the signals in all that noise. These are called event-related potentials, or ERPs. They are particular patterns of EEG waves that signify brain reactions to particular stimuli or events. ERPs have been used to evaluate complex functions such as attention, memory, and language, which makes this well-suited to assessing aspects of consciousness. For instance, people have specific responses when a sentence ends in an unexpected word, so this can be used to assess consciousness in locked-in syndrome. So far we have considered consciousness as having high and low levels, and that we can move up and down these levels. What about when we are fully awake and aware? Are we maxed out during full consciousness? One view is that consciousness shifts to events or tasks that are most relevant. We latch onto what happens to be meaningful at a particular moment. Rather than asking how much consciousness someone is displaying, this perspective focuses on where conscious efforts are being spent. The compartmentalization of full consciousness is obvious when we consider controlled versus automatic processing. A lot of what we do every day re requires conscious effort and attention, like reading a chapter in a textbook. But a lot of what we do happens beneath our level of awareness. Take the act of reading itself. Once learned as a child, our consciousness about the process of reading is no longer required, so it happens automatically. In fact, once learned, it's difficult not to do. Just try looking at the words on the screen without reading them. I bet you can't. The involvement of consciousness in our everyday lives is illustrated by an experiment by researchers at Western University using the Ebbinghaus illusion, shown here. Although the central circle on the left is the same size as the one on the right, the one on the right appears larger. Our conscious visual perception produces the illusion of two differently sized objects. However, when researchers asked participants to grasp the central circle, they held their fingers the same distance apart, indicating that motor responses are not fooled by the conscious visual illusion. Another example of the divided nature of consciousness comes from studies of attention. Selective attention is the ability to focus awareness on specific features in the environment while ignoring others. Ignoring unnecessary or irrelevant information is important, but it means that we often miss things. Look at these two photos. Can you spot the difference? The globe in the center captures our attention, so it's easy to miss the other details. Selective attention can result in inattentional or change blindness, whereby we miss things because we are selectively attending to something else. So can we even measure full consciousness? Because full consciousness is not packaged neatly into levels, it may seem impossible. However, we can become aware of conditions when our consciousness shifts by looking at tasks that require divided attention. For instance, imagine that you are at a crowded party having a conversation with a couple of friends. The background noise is mostly ignored because you direct your attention to the conversation. However, if someone in the crowd says your name, your attention shifts to the background noise that you had previously blocked out. This ability to filter out sounds and then refocus attention when you hear your name is called the cocktail party effect and is a demonstration of divided attention. 
One way to test this in the lab is with the dichotic listening task. Participants hear two different messages, one to each ear. They are told to pay attention to only one of them. If asked questions later, most people have very little memory of the ignored message, even though the sounds were played directly into one of the ears. During full consciousness, our attention is limited, so it acts as a filter so we can focus on important tasks and ignore other information. However, tuning out information is not always a good thing, particularly when driving. Most Canadian provinces have banned the use of handheld devices while driving, however the practice of talking and texting while driving is still widespread. Talking on a phone while driving produces gaps in attention and perception, even while using a hands-free phone. Research has shown that we drive with our minds, not just with our eyes and our hands. So although it might be difficult to directly measure full consciousness in the way that we measure coma states, we can certainly examine conditions under which full consciousness is interrupted.